When I was 10 years old, I remember coming home from a standard day of middle school. And that day, my doctor called me. And he had told our family that my father, who's actually in the audience today, had just gotten a heart attack. And he told us that on a flight back from Europe, he had gotten this heart attack about midway through and that he'd have to wait for about four hours before he would get treated before ambulances would meet his plane. And he told us that he was doing better, so I was optimistic. But I remember being sad and I remember being lonely. I remember thinking to myself, you know, what if that was me? What if something had gone differently? But I think most of all, what I remember about that moment was that I finally understood and I finally accepted the fact that life was really too short. You know, people tell you that every day. Life's too short, and I never believe them. I have so many days, I have so many years. And so life cannot possibly be short. But I finally accepted it that day. And the worst thing I realized that anyone could do is waste the life that they had. That everybody around us is given a finite number of moments, moments that they have to capture, to live to their fullest. And I vowed that day I would never live the moments that I had simply doing things that other people did. I would never just follow in the footsteps of others. I would never recreate their paths. I wanted to do something original. I vowed that day to make, make my own road. You know, when I was 11 years old, I was not a popular kid. I um, wore the same sweater, collar, t-shirt combination every single day. <laughs> and um, I was never interested in sports or games, or I was never interested in entertainment. I was more interested in chemicals, and I know it sounds weird, but I found it absolutely fascinating how two people could, two, one person could mix two chemicals together and it would combust, or it would become a solid, or something magical would happen. And scientists could innovate around things that they were doing in the lab. And I really, really wanted to work in a lab. But it turns out that there's no internship program, there's no stories of other people working in a lab at 11, nothing I could just copy, nothing I could just apply to. And so I had to do it for myself. And I remember over the next few weeks, I put together the email address of every single professor I could possibly find in the upstate New York area, which is where I was living. And I sent every single one of those 300 professors an email. Uh, I still remember the email, very childish email. Big letters, red and blue, alternating uh, letters, um, <laughs> Comic Sans MS. Basically telling them about me, telling them why I'm passionate about this work and if I could have the honor of working with them. And I got four responses of these 300 emails over a couple of weeks and I still remember these four very distinctly. The first three were discouraging. They said that there's a law in New York State that you have to be 16 years old in order to work in a lab. And so try again in five years. But the other one was pretty promising. You know, Dr. David Wu from the University of Rochester wrote me back with three words, let's have lunch. And I was like, I've never had lunch before with somebody <laughs> professionally. <laughs> and so let's see how this goes. But, uh, but the next day I went, to, I went to the Mario's Italian restaurant in Rochester, New York. I still remember it. And listened to him talk about his ideas, his passions, the experiments he was working on. He talked to me about the global energy crisis, that the world was running out of fossil fuels and we needed a new form of energy to kind of take over. And he was thinking about those kinds of problems. And at the end of the lunch, he asked me, do you want to spend three weeks look, looking around, working in this lab, and see what you come up with? If you have an idea, you can pursue it. If not, don't worry about it. And those three weeks turned into five and a half years. For five and a half years, I worked in that lab. I ran out of the lab whenever there was a safety inspection. He never knew the rule, so he just got away with it. <laughs> Until I was 16, and I proudly stood there. But for five and a half years, I worked in that lab. In five and a half years, I got to mentor graduate students, students who were a lot older than me. I developed a technology when I was about 13 or 14 to create bioethanol, a potential alternative energy from waste materials, from trees and grass and paper, for 25 cents a gallon. And I'm hoping that one day I pursue this, I commercialize it. But I was so excited about it. I was so excited to be working with these people that were so much older than me and so cool. And looking back, the awards are great. The honors are great. The achievements were cool. But what I was most proud of was the journey I took to get there, was the amount of boundaries I got to leap over. And the path that I took that was original, it was mine, and I could be, a part, I could be proud of. When I was 14, when I had finally successfully converted waste to a form of biofuel for the first time ever, 
Um, I was really excited about the possibilities of applying it to real life, how it could help people in the future. And I wanted to do something. Oh, there's the pictures of me working from a young age. Um, I really wanted to apply this work that I had done to the real world. And I did a lot of research, and I realized that big biotech companies across the world were working on similar problems that I was really interested in. And being 14 at the time, it was kind of an unorthodox school, but I made it my goal to work at one of these companies that summer. And again, it didn't turn out that there was an internship program. There was no stories I could just follow. There was no roads that had been built before that could get there. And so I tried to do the same thing I had done three years earlier. I sent 100 emails and see what sticks. But the problem was that finding those emails was a lot tougher than it had been three years ago. Finding the emails of anyone in industry is usually a lot harder. And so I guessed them. I spent about two weeks writing down every single name of executive, every lab member, every HR person at every company that was doing some sort of biofuel work and put 10 iterations of possible email addresses next, next to every single name. <laughs> you know, first name dot last name at company or first initial last name at company and sent every single one of those email addresses an email saying the same thing, you know, who I am, what I had done, why I'm passionate. And a lot of them bounced back to my inbox, um, but a few of them stuck and a few of them I got right. And I still remember getting several responses saying, no, sorry, you must be 18, or sorry, we're not accepting anyone else for this summer. Except for one more, one more email from an executive at DuPont. And he told me, let's have a phone call. And I've never had a phone call either, so this is kind of another, <laughs> this is a kind of another first. Um, and he told me, let's schedule a time with my assistant, which I took to mean call him right now. So I called his cell phone number, which was in the, in the footer of the email. And he, walked me through DuPont, and the end of the conversation, he asked me, how old are you? And I said, 14, I'm super excited. I said, 14 years old, I'm super excited about this problem. He said, sorry, you have to be 16 to work here. Why don't you try back in a couple of years? But I wasn't taking no for an answer from him. And I said, no, 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 listen, I don't have any more legal abilities when I turn 16 as I have right now. And so there's no reason why I should have to be 16 in order to do this. Like, you guys put a status quo on the age of 16 that they are capable of the following. But I think I'm capable of that now. And I think that if you let me, I can show you that. And I don't know if it was him being annoyed at me. I don't know if it was him just genuinely being interested in me. But he's like, OK, let's make it happen. In the summer of 2008, I worked on the cellulosic ethanol team at DuPont. And basically tweaked a technology that's now being sold for millions of dollars, all because was persistent and didn't let him off the phone until he said yes to me. And looking back at that, it's awesome. I'm so proud of myself for doing that. And it's one of the highlights of my life. Got to work with some of the smartest people that I've ever been able to work for in my life. Now, about four months ago, taking, I took a wild tangent from this biofuels route. Um, and it's a tangent that I'm very proud of, though. About four months ago, I dropped out of Harvard. And um, I moved across the country to Los Angeles and now work for a startup called Scopely. And you know, in today's day and age, education is not just viewed as important, it's viewed as necessary. You know, having an undergrad is more of a box checked rather than something people genuinely appreciate. And so for me, it upset a lot of people when I left. You know, my parents, my mentors, my friends were very upset that I was making this decision to leave a place that I had been so blessed to be at to do something completely different. But for me, it was necessary. It was fascinating for me to do something hands-on. You know, Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, the first investor in Facebook, you know, says that education is a bubble, that it's not housing, it's not debt, it's education. And when I was a sophomore in college, he offered this fellowship. He's like, OK, I'm going to pay 20 kids $100,000 to do anything besides school. Just do something. You have to leave school, but do something. And somehow I got one of those. I got one of those 20 fellowships. And I was faced with this decision. Do I leave school and do something entrepreneurial, or do I stay here and probably make a very standard good life for myself? And I took the leap of faith, and I did the first one. I left school. But I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Absolutely no idea what I was doing. And so I started to email tons of people. It was what I was good at now. I'd done it so many times. I was so good at it. And so I emailed every single person I could possibly find. I guessed people's Gmail addresses. I guessed people's email addresses. And I just asked for conversations, and asked for help, and asked for advice. And one of these such emails was about this guy who I'd read about on TechCrunch. He had founded Google Ads and sold it to Google, generating a ton of money there, and now left to do something entrepreneurial again. And I guessed his Gmail address. I remember guessing his Gmail address correctly. And I sent him an email describing what I was passionate about. And 
to this day, I remember his response. He told me, why don't you fly to Los Angeles, live at my place, and drive my second car around? And that was it. That's all he said to me. I was like, I'd love to take you up on that offer. I don't have my driver's license because I never got it when I was in high school, but everything else I would love to take you up on. And the next day I flew to LA and I met him and he introduced me to several people. He introduced me to three of the most inspirational entrepreneurs I had ever met in my life who were working on this social entertainment idea. Now if you remember, I never played games. I never, I didn't watch a ton of movies. I wasn't really that tapped into the social uh, like entertainment in the United States. And so for me, an idea around social entertainment was completely outside my comfort zone. But I loved it. I absolutely loved that. And by the end of our conversation, he asked me, he's like, listen, we're just starting up. And do you want to run the business side of our company? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> absolutely. And so flash forward about four months later, no idea whether Scopely is going to be successful or not. But I get to run the business side of a really cool company. I've seen Scopely grow from a four-person to a 23-person company. I've seen us raise millions of dollars in funding. I've gotten my driver's license. <laughs> and looking back, these have been four of the months where I've learned the most at any point in my entire life. More than I ever learned in school, more than I ever learned in high school. I've matured more, and I'm able to lead a group of people who are older than me in a way that's very new and exciting. And as I look back on the three stories I told, you know, I'm so excited, I'm so proud of capturing those moments. And I have no idea where this road is going to lead, but I'm excited about the outcome. Now, Robert Frost once wrote a very famous poem that many of you guys have heard. You know, he talked about whether, he talked about a situation in which you approach a path. And at that path, there's two crossroads. One of the crossroads is very easy. It's been walked on by many people. And the other one is difficult. You know, it hasn't been walked on by too many people. It's murky. And he asked you the question, he posited, if you were to approach this crossroads, which of the two paths would you take? Would you take the one that's easier? Would you take the one that's been walked on by many people? Or would you take the harder one? And society dictates to us that we choose the latter path, that you know, society has told us, take risks, do something crazy, and so take the latter one. And so that's seemingly the correct answer. But what if Frost left out the most important one of the most important one. What if you left out the third path, the one that you will create, the one that's yours, the one that you own, the one that you will be the first person to walk on? And for me, that path entailed working in a lab, working at DuPont, and taking a mile-long tangent to working at a gaming company in Los Angeles. But I love that path. I own that path. And I have no idea where it's going to go, but I'm proud of it. And so I'll leave you with one question, which is, what's your path going to be? At the end of your road, what are you going to look back and be like, wow, that's awesome. I own that. I'm so excited.